Hey, welcome back. It's time now to take a look at what uh, made it to the front pages of some of our national dailies. We'll begin this morning with the punch. But first of all, let's introduce our guest. Our guest this morning is uh, Mr. Tunde Kolawole. Good morning and welcome to the show, Tunde. Good morning, my brother. Thanks for having me. Okay, so uh, we're beginning with the Punch newspaper and uh, screaming headlines there uh, uh, on the Punch is Labour threatens indefinite strike, gives one week ultimatum uh, to government. And the writers are uh, giving a bag of rice to 12 people, 100 million naira to each lawmaker is insulting, according to Labour. Then government has absconded from negotiation table, fails to meet workers' demands, says NLC. <laughs> then other headlines there before we begin to pick them one after the other are Nigerians to clear goods from Cotonou ports. That's according to customs and the stories on page 30. Despite serial challenges, Nigerians believe in democracy or post authoritarianism. That's on page 3. Tinubu orders probe as 901 die in 61 boat accidents. Um, one dies as truck crashes on Lagos Bridge, uh, here, so Tedola Bridge. And then, um, okay, those are the headlines we will take from the punch. Let's begin with uh, the post subsidy talks. Labor threatens indefinite strike and gives one week ultimatum. Uh, let's begin with that. Your thoughts? Well, um, honestly speaking, we are between the devil and the deep blue sea. When you look at the final state of the Nigerian economy, the crisis with regard to Naira, the hyperinflation, which incidentally is also happening uh, all over the world, and then the modern economy, the petroleum that we sell, which is no longer selling, you want to ask yourself, where will the government find the resources to pilot the affairs of the state if they don't remove a spare subsidy, especially with regards to the trillions of Naira debt that is hanging over the head of the nation like um, the sword of Tamoko. On the other hand, with regards to beep. Hello? Yeah, we can hear you. With regards to the worries of the labor, how does an average worker or an ordinary citizen in this country survive with the hyperinflation that we have in the society? Well, that's unfortunate. We cannot continue for now uh, with Mr. Tunde Kolawole as soon as we can uh, uh, rejoin him. Uh, when that problem is solved, uh, then we are going to rejoin him. In the meantime, let's just take a look at uh, the headlines on uh, these national dailies. Uh, when he returns, we are going to continue um, talking about them. Let's, as, just as a reminder, still on the punch, Nigeria to clear uh, goods from Cotonou ports. Uh, despite serial challenges, Nigerians believe in democracy, oppose authoritarianism, and Tinubu orders probe as 100 and, or, or 901 die in 61 boat accidents. Remember, uh, on our, one of our trending topics was the fact that 30 people have died. From the number 26, it has now risen to 30 people that have died in Niger State because a boat capsized. And we've been hearing stories like this. So from the records now, 61 boat mishaps have cost Nigerians uh, the lives of uh, 901 people. And those are the ones that are documented. There are some that may not have been on a boat that is carrying up to 100 people or 50 people that will make the news. Maybe three here, four there, two there, and so on. So if 901 have died in 61 boat accidents, then it should be something that the government should really look into by providing what they need to provide, maybe life jackets or monitoring the people who are operating this very well. Okay, Mr. Tunde uh, Kolawole, um, I understand you have rejoined us. Welcome back. Uh, the people that are the people who 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 are
Your audio is your audio is not very good, Mr. Kolawole. I don't know why. Maybe you'll cut and call back. Hello. While we wait for him to return, let's take a look at um, other headlines from other um, dailies. Uh, let's go to The Guardian. When he comes back, he will continue with the train of th thoughts that uh, he had. Uh, on The Guardian newspaper, we hear that Obazi panel haunts conspirators in alleged 7 trillion naira frauds linked to MFLA. Bandits sack 15 communities in Taraba, Monarch laments. We also have a story that two years after cargo movement begins on Apapa Ibadan, $1.5 billion rail line. Mm. Petrol diesel cost may soar as oil prices rise amid tighter supply. From Malami to Fagbemi in search of holistic reform for the judici judiciary. That's a news analysis on page four of the Guardian newspaper. And uh, there's also a story uh, suggesting that multi-dimensional approach is necessary to curb unemployment. That's the Guardian newspaper I'm reading. But I'm leaving the Guardian now to the Nation newspaper. The Nation newspaper uh, reads, or the, 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 the boldest headline there is, Crisis rocks on Do Exco over Akeridulu deputy feud. Remember that the governor, Akeridulu, returned a few days ago from his medical leave. Uh, federal government targets inflation cut with 50% FARC savings. Cargoes for evacuation to decongest Lagos ports. Flood storm kills over 5,000 in Libya town. Trade between Nigeria and EU grows to 45 billion euros. And um, we also have, okay, the, the writers on the story of uh, Ondo State is um, Governor fires Deputy Governor's aides. Ayeda Tiwa says, I remain loyal, and Commissioner's S.A.'s Jitri. So we wonder what uh, the sheriff uh, has come back to do. The sheriff that left for medical tourism has returned, and we are hearing uh, problems coming from Ondo State. We do hope they will uh, solve those problems, and we do hope it's not going to be like the Edo, Edo problems that we've heard from deputy and and the governor we hear that he was even relocated the deputy was relocated to a place that they are just trying to renovate now removed from the government house and so many other stories coming from there why would these people be fighting and when two elephants fight what do they say is the people that suffer so we go to uh all right we'll return to uh mr Hello. okay uh tunde it's good to have you back okay go ahead with a train of thoughts your audio was bad at that time, so I'm glad that you're back now. Go ahead with what you were talking about regarding an um, NLC and uh, federal government. Okay. Something seems to be happening to Tunde this morning. Nature News is our next stop. And G20 Summit, UK pledges record $2 billion to Africa's Green Climate Fund. Green Climate Fund pledges to spend £11.6 billion um, pounds on international climate finance. Okay. UAE commits $4.5 billion investment in African clean energy. Governor Zulum launches 70 buses for metro transport in Bornu. We also have uh, NIMET forecast three days of thunderstorm cloudiness in Abuja. Uh, I do hope that everybody will be listening. All the communities in Nigeria will be listening. I say this because of what... The unfortunate event that happened in Benue State a few months ago, where two people were killed uh, by the thunderstorm, mm -hmm. and uh, the community came and killed or beat one man to death because they felt that he was responsible for this 
So now Nimet is telling you that there might be thunderstorms. Do not go and kill somebody because of this. Okay, Mr. Kolawole, I'm glad that you're back. Yes, NLC, threatening strike. Again, that was what you were talking about before we, we went off. Can you hear me? Hello. Can you hear me now? Okay, Mr. Kola will still can't hear me. Uh, I hope that will be rectified in time. So, Nimet forecast three days of thunderstorm cloudiness in Abuja. So, it may not even just be Abuja. For where, wherever we find this, we should know that it's a natural phenomenon. If someone is out and by stroke of misfortune, they are caught up in the storm and a thunder strikes and somebody dies, Please know that it's a natural phenomenon. Like I was saying, there was this story from Benway State where someone was beaten to death because they suspected him of being the one who sent thunder to kill a man and his wife, I think. How can people at this time, this day and age, still be thinking like this? So now, Nimet has forecast three days of uh, thunderstorm and cloudiness in Abuja. Whether it is in Abuja or anywhere else in Nigeria, please know that this thing can occur. And if it does occur, if there's anything you can do to keep yourself safe, you do it to keep yourself safe. Do not blame village people for everything in Nigeria. Okay, Mr. Kolaole. Yes, please. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Okay, let's go back to the story on the punch where we were talking about NLC and your three yeah. thoughts. Yeah, go ahead, please. Okay. Now, as I was saying, when one looks at the grievances of the NLC, mm. one will know that those grievances are genuine and passable. And that is not just peculiar to labor alone, but to all Nigerian citizens. Mm. Life has become so difficult because Naira has lost almost all its value. Inflation is, uh, is real. And then, uh, the food security that ordinary people should be able to cushion us against this adversity. The farmers have often not been able to go to the farm because of kidnapping and banditry. So, one would say, if the government does not remove the subsidy, they might not have the resources to really manage the affairs of the Nigerian state. But I think what the government of it's not to put the cart before the horse. Rather, they should have put on ground a regime of finance and a regime of food security in terms of uh, ensuring that farmers are able to go to the farm, banditry and kidnapping of the family. After all, Ukraine is at war now and is still able to export their grain and other food and materials. They are also manufacturing most of the arms and ammunition, or some of the arms and ammunition that they require. So if a country like Korea is able to do it, Nigeria should also be able to do it. Then again, they should have uh, prepared the refineries. Give licenses to more Nigeria who are interested in refining, in refining petroleum products. So that if we are able to produce petrol here in Nigeria, the issue of importing it at high cost that the ordinary man cannot really be able to buy will not be able to, I mean, will not be there. Thirdly, one would have expected the federal government to resuscitate some of the vehicle assembly plants, like Anamco in Anambra, which manufacture buses and northern. And then we also have here in the Pauchi. And then I think a Milan in Ibado, and then a Porto in Kaduna, and Volkswagen in Nigeria. If South Africa is able to produce vehicles and export to other countries, I don't see a reason why we should not be able to do it. So these are a couple of things that the federal government, the state government, the local government would have been able to do before going ahead to wholesale withdraw the subsidy of petroleum products. 
But, but I, I, do, I do think this government is going to do that when even the um, car manufacturing plant that we have in Nigeria is not being encouraged, it's not being patronized. Uh, other countries can come and, and buy cars here, but Nigerians, no, they want to go out and buy cars from another place. Nobody wants to take... So there's, there's that fear. But right now, you have just mentioned things that they could have done, that we're supposed to do before the removal of fuel subsidy. But what about the things that they are even doing right now? For instance, one of the things that uh, Labour is saying is that giving a bag of rice to 12 people and one mil 100 million naira to each lawmaker is insulting. Meaning that the lawmakers are earning so much as palliative, uh, earning so much as, uh, as allowances, as salaries or anything, and then you're telling families to go get... 8,000 or 10,000 naira for a full month, for six months, and after that, there's no, nothing that will come again. So they're seeing this as an insult. And this is not an LSE thing. It's, it's about Nigeria, like you said earlier yes. on. So they are doing the things that are annoying to the people of Nigeria, even when they couldn't do the things that they were supposed to do to make Nigeria better or make life easier for everybody. Mm. Now my concern is, if they have removed subsidy, I'm just asking you how you feel about it. They've removed subsidy. Every state is thinking about how to buy buses that will be plying the roads, how to distribute uh, rice and other food items and all that to the people. Who will be fueling the buses? Uh, if that is not subsidy, who they are going to spend money to buy the buses. That is not subsidy. They are going to buy the rice that they are going to give the people. That is not subsidy. If all this money were to be gathered and re spent on this uh, fuel, that the subsidy that they have removed, according to them, will it not serve the same purpose now that they have good da data of how much fuel we consume in the country? I'm just wondering like a layman. Oh dear. Okay, um, we'll wait for Tunde to rejoin us, but we were at Nature News when uh, uh, we had information that Tunde has returned. Uh, like I was saying, Zulum launches 70 buses for metro transport in Borno. I do hope that there are people or governors who are launching these buses within uh, the state. They are also thinking, or maybe the federal government is thinking about uh, buses that will be plying intercity, not just the intracity that we are having. For instance, if in Lagos State we have buses that the state government has graciously said, okay, it's only 50% that we are going to be paying for the fares. Uh, what about if you want to go to Ibadan, for instance? Who takes care of you? There are people who never, ever uh, leave their houses to go to a particular place to work. Maybe they are still at home, but they are finding it difficult to feed because of the things that are happening because of the removal of the fuel subsidy. So how are these people going to be captured as well? There are people who maybe because of accommodation problems in Lagos, they live in Ogun State and they are coming to work in Lagos State. How are you also going to make sure that these people enjoy uh, the, 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 the palliatives that you're giving to the people. Because if they're coming from Ogun to work in Lagos, they're working for Lagos and in Lagos. So how will these people also be captured? Uh, okay, Tunde, uh, are you back? Tunde? Yes, I'm back. Okay. So yes. did you hear me when I was uh, trying to m make a comment? Yes, I did. Yes. I did. Okay, you, were, you were talking about the, the disparity between what the legislature Yes. And the people in the local arm of government are located to themselves and what they are giving out to the people. To the ordinary Nigerian. Yes, I agree with you that there is a wide gap between what the ordinary Nigerian are supposed to say and what the people in government are getting. Uh, remember the also that a legislator the remember also that a legislator came out to say um, last week or two weeks ago that they have no cost to cut because already the money they are earning is not so much. So when people are crying that they should cut the cost of governance by the kind of money that they earn in the National Assembly, he said there is nothing to cut because it's not even enough. Well, Go ahead. Well, you will remember that uh, some time ago, some non-governmental organizations did a comparative analysis 
on what the legislation of the Nigeria end. This have you want to end in the UN, Canada, Germany, Britain, and what have And the Nigerian legislation was described as one of the highest enemies, one of the highest in the world. Mm. And when you compare the output vis a vis the money at the end, there is no justification or rationale for it. So the legislator, when they say the kind of thing that they themselves have said, they are merely talking, I mean, they are merely spiting the Nigerian people, which is very, very unbecoming. But you should not be surprised that they are saying that. I have always said it, and I'm not going to be tired of saying it, that our legislator, most people will consider the Nigerian. They are near colonial. They don't see themselves as part of us. They think that they are a special breed of human beings that should be specially catered for by the taxpayer. And that is not fair. We can, and people have been advocating that ordinarily some of these legislators, the office of assembly, the councillors at the local government, and uh, even at the federal level. Some of these uh, people should be well just uh, sitting around one thing when they go to sit in parliament. Furthermore, we have been advocating that we should have a unicameral legislator collapse both the House of Rep with the Senate and then let maybe one one party or two party from the state constitute the National Assembly so as to bring down the cost of governance. But they are not ready to do this. Well, when labor, I mean, these are some of the reasons. One cannot fault labor when they insist on going on strike so as to put pressure on the National Assembly or the legislature, so as to put pressure on the executive arm of government so that they begin to see reason and think like the ordinary Nigerian. You will not believe it. If not that they will be outside, the Nigerian legislator who even have insisted that they should be paid in dollars and pan talent mm. because they transact uh, most of their businesses in foreign currency. Well, it's terrible. Okay, we'll move to The Guardian. Um, some of the stories that are on punch are also on The Guardian, and I'd like to take this one. Uh, two years after, cargo movement begins on Apapa Ibadan, and $1.5 billion rail line. Two years after. Now, the cargo movement begins on Apapa Ibadan, $1.5 billion rail line. What are your thoughts? Well, thank God that uh, they have been able to report the that rail line. But let's remind ourselves that this is not a new innovation. That rail track has always been there. But somehow, for this is best known to us as a people, we refuse to use that rail line. Rather, people went in there and vandalized those rail tracks, and then the train from the port to the interland and stopped functioning. Now that they have resuscitated this, it's likely to put the, I mean, it will not, I mean, it will reduce the pressure on road hauling, which has been one of those things uh, that damage our road, that are constructed with billions of, uh, of a naira. But honestly, while I appreciate what the Lagos what the Lagos State government is doing, while I appreciate what the federal government is saying with regards to rail development, I must still say I am not uh, too happy about what they are doing. A country like India, a country like South Africa, and some of these uh, UAE, uh, United Arab Emirates, very, very tiny countries, they are investing in bullet train. So if other nations are investing in bullet train, that can travel 351 kilometers per hour, why will Nigeria be invested in locomotive rail in the 21st century? So, we are not moving forward, we are rather stagnating. 
and then we begin to clap, we begin to elodize all this obsolete and archaic technology that have been thrown in our face. After all, what France is doing presently, the government is putting the little investment and then they are after to the time. And they have done the cost and benefit around it. That way will be able to pay back the cost of financing it within a span of a year. So why don't we look at development in that direction? Construct a bullet train, amortize the cost of financing, I mean the cost of a construction, and then give yourself some year within which to pay back. If you had gone abroad to borrow money to build a bullet train from America to a place like Potato or to Abba and then to Kaduna Abuja, we would benefit more from it. With what we are doing now, it's going to be double expenditure because sooner than later, those locomotive trains, nobody will be producing them again. And so we will have cost to replace the locomotive train with modern rail line. In fact, when you go and read from from, from donors coming, coming from China, they have developed a, a train now that can run faster than the aeroplane. 681 or 87 kilometers per hour. It's a flying rail. So, these are the directions which we should be looking and not investing in uh, obsolete technology. Hmm. Okay, uh, let's look at another, he at another headline. Obaze panel haunts conspirators in alleged 7 trillion naira fraud linked to MFLA. Remember the special investigator hired by the federal government uh, to look into CBN and all uh, connected in entities. Now they're, they're clamping down on people who they term conspirators in the 7 trillion naira fraud linked to the Central Bank of Nigeria governor? Mm. Well, what I am not a fan of uh, Mr. MFLN, I will see one to say that I vehemently disagree with the way the man is being treated. We who are loyal, we are but we hate. We don't like people pleading for evidence after a suspect has been arrested. The federal government should have done his investigation before going ahead to arrest Mr. Mepele and then beginning to do propaganda as regards what mismanagement he has engaged with. Because you will remember when he was arrested, they first took him to court for possessing a brain gun and under our law, uh, which means without um, charges that they made, they, that they merely went to court on the holding chart. And our constitution found at the holding chart that you first arrest a man, and after you have arrested him, you will be looking for evidence, infractions with which to nail him. That will not jail. And this media trial to be treated with a lot of uh, levity. Mefele hasn't conducted the affairs of the CBN in an holistic manner or the world of all we have uh, expected, especially the minor denomination. But that does not mean we should discountenance fair hearing. That does not mean we should uh, deposition the presumption of innocence. That does not mean we will now begin to pick for evidence with which to nail him. Okay. So that's my take on that. All right. Um, petrol, diesel cost may soar as oil prices rise amid tighter supply. That's another well, headline. Yeah. That is uh, the way and manner the capitalist economy works. That is all good and services are left to the mercy of the uh, market forces. Immediately, the cost of petroleum rising in the terminal market, the pump prices are bound to rise around the world, and especially in countries where there is no subsidy. In fact, we begin to deal with this punctuation as long as uh, 
we retain this lack of subsidy um, a regime where uh, when you look around the world there is no country that does not uh, put in place one regime of subsidy or the other in places like Britain in America cost of public transportation cost of food are subsidized they even have food banks in some of those places that the indigent people that unemployed people can walk into and get at least one square meal a day. So, Nigerians should break off for a bumpy ride. The only solution to insulating ourselves from the value of translation for petroleum products is for us to develop new refineries. It is also for us to repair the existing refineries that have been come out of all this uh, while. Okay, uh, we move to yeah, we move to Ondo State. Uh, remember that uh, uh, Governor Kerudulu has been out or had been out for like three months uh, on a health tourism somewhere else in uh, this <laughs> globe. <laughs> yes, it's health tourism. He's back now, and every th time what we are hearing is that there is a feud between him and the deputy who held the fort for the three months that he was away. Now the deputies' aides have been fired. Uh, we are looking at a situation where maybe on those state and a do state will just uh, uh, be the same. What is happening in a do state is unfortunate, and now it is beginning in on those state. So I don't know what you see about this uh, uh, governor and the deputies' feud in on those state. Well, uh, it's a rather very very unfortunate. Uh, which is, let me start with uh, the health tourism that we talked about. If Governor Kerebolu had not used state resources to finance his treatment abroad, I think uh, we should not hold any grudge against him. A man who has uh, ailment or who is sick should have the right to treat himself wherever he could get a good treatment so long as he doesn't use the taxpayer's money to treat him time. With regards to the field between himself and his uh, deputy, where those are the kind of things that we have been seeing since 1999, when we returned to this the constitution has not uh, given very clear provision as regards what the work of the deputy to really be. So they are merely used as um, a kind of spare tire by the governor, by the president, by the local government, uh, their man. So we probably would have to rethink that the constitution that will make clear provision with regards to uh, the work that the deputies should actually engage themselves with. Furthermore, you and I do know. Most times, it is the governor that can pick whoever they want to use as a deputy governor. So if somebody can pick you, you are rather at the whims and capacity of such a party people. You are their mercy. I think that is what we continue to see with regards to the challenges most of the deputy governors are facing. But more importantly, let me say this, that there is a need for tolerance a lot of tolerance on the part of the government because you find out when the governor or the president goes and talks, the people will begin to keep them with a lot of uh, false information, with a lot of lies, so as to be able to create a rift between the government and the deputies. Also remember that when President Buhari went abroad for, uh, for treatment, a lot of people inside that in Rock also tried to create a link between Buhari and Oshimbato. So that immediately Buhari came back from abroad, he stood Oshimbato of most of the portfolio, of most of the work that he had given to him, most of the military apparatus that he had asked him to be handling. But again, let's say this to Kublai Dolu, 
I looked at his picture. Immediately he came back. It doesn't appear to me that uh, Governor Kredolu has uh, fully recovered. Why is rushing back to take uh, me to return to office beats my imagination. When it comes to feeding, what I create the loo will eat, what I create the loo will wear, uh, new houses, feed the ones who want, I create the loo can afford it. So why does he have to take his head? Merely because he wants to uh, return to the seat of the government. Those are the kind of things that uh, ended the I mean, that ended a lot of the uh, uh, life. If the Aradua had not sought to be president of Nigeria with the kidney ailment that he had, he probably would have been alive today. But he insisted on being the president of the country, and the rigors of that office, at the end of the day, consumed him. We will pray for Governor Kere Dolu that what happened to Yaradua does not really happen to him. But if I were him, life is more important than office. The office will be there forever. But once we lose our life, we hardly can get it back. Akiri Tolu should take care of himself. And he should not allow all the rumors, all the mouth all the lies, all the hatred that people have been seeing with regards to his deputy to declare the sense of judgment. For God's sake, he found the man worthy in the first instance. That was why he made him his deputy. So he, he should demonstrate more maturity. Yes, he is a man in the 70s. He is a lawyer, a, a thin advocate for that matter. A highly experienced person. Everything that he requires to live a comfortable life, for the end of his life, he has it. So, Akira Dolu should take it easy with his deputy if he is insisting on returning back to the governor's uh, seat. Okay, um, well, there's this story about, uh, still on the Nation newspaper, Nation newspaper, uh, federal government uh, targets inflation cut with 50% fax savings. Yeah, so 50%... Federal government um, targets inflation cut with 50% uh, fax saving. <laughs> All this uh, breaking wood there. Uh... IMF uh, recommendation cannot really work in our economy. The kind of proposal they are making assumes that people have surplus to pay. The kind of uh, approach they are giving me assumes that we are producing anything in this country. The kind of proposal that they are making assumes that the state of our infrastructure is a perfect system. Is a, is a, is a, a, a no. Where you have deficiencies in all the areas that I have mentioned, all these IMF recommendations or approach to solving or attacking or curtailing inflation will not work. Say, for example, when they came in, they said they were imagining the foreign exchange, the, the dual, uh, the black market, and then uh, the, the official market rate of um, uh, selling the hard currency or foreign exchange. We have experienced it now for more than 100 days. Has it uh, improved the fortune of the Naira? The answer is no. It will not improve the fortune of the Naira because we are not producing. Because people don't even have enough to stay. Because there is no food security, farmers cannot go to the market. I mean, cannot go to the farm and then till the store. Nobody is manufacturing anything. From toothpick to sophisticated uh, road points and uh, land cruisers that the legislators are writing, they are all sourced from abroad. Rather, I would advise the federal government they should concentrate on the productive base of the economy. I made this recommendation the last time I spoke with you, and I want to repeat it again, which is to say that. Let the federal government, the federal regime, concentrate on solving the challenges in the power sector. Let them maintain existing infrastructure, and then let them let them do massive investment in agriculture, and then let them be able to maintain the existing infrastructure that we have in the country. 
If they are able to do this, inflation will gradually come down and the economy will begin to bounce back. Okay. Well, they thought that that was going to be very, very uh, good for them to cut um, something from 50% cut of FARC allocation. Now, they are cutting that. They are also, on the other hand, giving palliatives uh, to the state okay. governments. And <laughs> so I don't really know what is going on uh, now. The, the palliative to the state government is money than the brain. Why do I say it's money than the brain? Remember that uh, President Buhari gave a lot of money to the state to cushion the challenges they are presently facing. Also remember that Dr. Gulag Jonathan also made a lot of money available to the state and the local government. But what happened to that money? Most of the state merely used them to buy vehicles, cars for themselves, they use it to improve their wardrobe, increase their own partner allowance, and then uh, the money went down. I have a feeling that the president's money being given to the state uh, might end up the same manner in which all the previous bailouts have always ended. We should do things properly. Using money to fight inflation or using money to fight the challenges that we have all over the country today will not solve the problem. What we need to do is to go back to production in the area of agriculture, in the area of uh, manufacturing, in the area of uh, uh, improving the technical know-how of our people. Say, for example, the other world, the developed world, their commitment now is to artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is taking over the industries, the hospitals, uh, the roads, and what have you. So that is the direction we should be looking at. If we are left behind, it will take another 100 years to catch up with the civilized world. That's what a Nigerian will say. <laughs> we should not be left behind. <laughs> Mr. Tude thank you so much for being a part of our show this morning. As always, it's a pleasure mm -hmm. having you on the show. Thanks for having me. Mm -hmm. You have a great day. You too. Bye. That was uh, Tunde Kolawole, legal practitioner, talking to us from Lagos here. We'll take a short break. When we return, we'll go to our first hot topic. Stay with us. <laughs>